Well, hello. I'm really excited to welcome today with Life's Co-Pilot. We're, uh, we've got a speaker, Jay Balunas. He is president of Angry Ape Creative, and uh, that, that in itself should be an interesting conversation to find out what that's all about. But he's going to be talking to us about branding your business and that consistency is key to that. So, Jay, I'm going to turn it over to you and let you roll with this. Okay. Um, so, yeah, today I'm going to talk about branding. Um, some of the components that go into branding and um, hopefully Jim has some questions along the way, but um, we'll go from there. So I guess the title of my presentation is um, branding your business, business consistency is key. Um, but um, first of all, you know, you think of the word branding, where, where does the word branding come from? Uh, what does it mean? And so in the, I guess it's oldest definition, it's an identifying mark that was burned into livestock with a branding iron. Um, so the brand on the sheep identifies it as mine. Um, so brands were also used other ways as well, but um, that's basically the, the oldest definition of branding, but a more modern definition of branding, um, the term refers to a business or marketing concept that helps people identify a particular company, product, or individual. So brands can be intangible, uh, which means you can't actually touch them, you can't always see them, um, but they help people, they help shape people's perception of a company, their products, and individuals. Um, so this will make more sense as we go on. Um, I think a lot of people just think of brand as someone's logo, but it's a little bit more than that. Um, so uh, your brand is something that uniquely identifies you to your audience or your potential audience. Um, most time when we're thinking of brand, we're thinking of a visual brand uh, or a logo, um, but it's more than that. So you have a brand consists of your logo, your colors, your fonts, your tagline, it could be your sounds. So if you have a, um, a particular jingle or ring, um, or sound that go that goes with your commercials or or your your business in general. So think of McDonald's. Um, I'm loving it. So that that sound, like when I say that, you probably can think of how it sounds on the commercial. I'm not going to try to sing it for you, but um, you can think of how it, how it sounds in the commercial. So that's part of their brand. Um, it could be taste. Um, so Coke, they have their special, special secret formula for their Coke products. Um, that's, that's part of their brand. Um, Kentucky Fried Chicken, they have their 11 herbs and spices. It's also a secret formula. Um, that's part of their brand. Um, customer service can also be part of a brand, whether you like it or not. Um, so if you have really great customer service, you like it. If you have horrible customer service, um, your brand, your brand that can be associated with your brand um, as being bad customer service. So airlines have been going through that. Um, some of the, you know, I guess cost-effective airlines, um, where they're pulling people off planes, roughing them up a little bit, um, or cable company. So I'm, today I'm waiting for the cable company to come. They gave me like a six hour window that they might show up. So it, to me, that's a negative um, brand connotation. So it's basically about the way people feel about you um, is, is associated with your brand. So there's a lot of things that go into branding. Um, so if you can think of your brand as what people think about you or your company when you're not there to tell them about it, it's whatever perception they have. So some, some big brands like Apple. So Apple makes computers and phones, um, but they're, they've positioned themselves more as a lifestyle company. So because I didn't check to see what, what their most recent tagline is. I can't remember they change it, but it used to be think different. Um, they used to try to be the, 
the counterculture or the um they used to be try to and they still try to position themselves as the small guy the different guy but they're one of the largest companies in the world um but they've positioned themselves as a lifestyle brand um, they make good computers good phones um but they don't position themselves as a computer or phone manufacturer um they're trying to sell you on their lifestyle and they're I mean, they've done a pretty good job at it. They've created, some people call it the Apple tax. We are paying just for the brand. Uh, you're paying, like you can get a comparable Windows machine that works just as well, just as fast as an Apple machine, um, but you're gonna pay a lot more for the Apple. Um, so they've built in that perception that it's that it's better um, and it's the, it's the cool thing to have to have uh, your iMac or your iPhone. Uh, McDonald's, their brand is, so they sell hamburgers um, at the root of it, but they position themselves as a happy, fun kind of brand because you know their food isn't, isn't all that healthy for you, um, but they've positioned themselves, you know, they've kind of pivoted away from just selling burgers. They're trying to sell happy fun so the commercial just loving it um and so happy meals um the big thing recently was happy meals for adults uh, so another company nike um so i i basically came up with larger companies to talk about but um nike so they're kind of systems position themselves as elite athletics um I heard a story. I mean, this was this was a while back, but they st that Nike stopped selling their shoes. It was in either um, Kmart or Walmart, or it was one of, one of the mass, you know, lower end market stores, big big box stores. But they decided not to sell their shoes in those stores anymore because they wanted to focus on higher end higher end audience. So they're trying to go for that elite. Kind of brand. So Nike, I mean, Nike sells probably, they've got to sell the most shoes in the world. Um, huge markup on them, and especially with the Jordans. Um, so if you think about Michael Jordan's brand, Jordan shoes, they, um, he's not even playing anymore, but he still sells Jordans. They still sell out. They're a collector, uh, a collector item for, for people for they call sneaker heads who love to collect shoes. Um, they've, he, they've positioned that brand as expensive as a status symbol. Um, Jordan even had a list of players while he was playing. I, think, I can't remember if it was while he was playing or after he retired, but he had a list of players that were invited to represent his brand. So they could wear Jordans and um, represent the Jordan brand. And he was very controlling of that brand. Um, so that's one of the things I'm gonna talk about is, you know, when you create a brand, you then have to control it and be consistent with it um, in order to make sure that it maintains the status or the, uh, the, the vision that you hope to, to put out for people to see. Um, my last example is Kanye West. So I don't know if anybody's been following any of the news on Kanye West. Um, so he put out some anti-Semitic, I don't know if there was posts on Twitter or on social media somewhere. Uh, basically he's destroying his own brand. Um, so he thought he was too big and too, uh, too important for anybody to 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 pull their advertising from, I didn't. So I don't follow Kanye that well at all. But um, so he recently changed his name to Ye for whatever reason. Um, but he made these statement. He made these statements, and he he didn't apologize for him. Wasn't going to retract him. And he and then he made a statement saying that that he was too too big, or not even Adidas would break like break up with them. Um, 
and they ended up canceling the contract. He lost billions of dollars um, when Adidas broke the contract. And then everybody else started um, falling in line. And um, I think he's banned from Twitter. Um, so, I mean, he's been a, a controversial person uh, in general, but, but by you know, some of the brands that he works with, don't want to be associated with that. They don't want to tarnish their brand uh, by having him associated with them. So they're pulling away from him. And then you know, it's, it remains to be seen if he destroys his brand because he's always been kind of out there, um, controversial, saying very divisive things. So maybe that won't hurt him. Um, but he's definitely lost a lot of uh, money and contract deals through it. So that's kind of just a general... When you're thinking of your brand, your brand is, so there's a lot of elements that go into your brand, your logo, your colors, your sounds, taglines, but it's basically your brand is like, you can try to create a brand, you can create all the elements, but it's how people perceive you that makes up your brand. Um, and that's what you end up living with. So um, sometimes people, have a brand and then somebody goes after them. Um, they do one thing wrong and then the brand is tarnished. Um, and some people make it back, some people don't. Um, so that's why you know, some companies will, will shut down or they'll rebrand or other things like that. You know, a lot of our audiences are small business owners or maybe they're marketers of a company or what have you. Some of them have started something out of whole cloth. You know, this is my idea and this is my business and this is what I'm going to do. I know that you at, at uh, uh, Angry Ape deal with this on, you know, th that type of thing, helping people get up and running. What um, what kind of things if somebody, let's say somebody is, they've got an idea, they want to get something started, they want to get their, you know, they want to create a brand. How does one go about trying to think through the process of creating a brand? So actually that was my next part is- okay. uh, is, is starting a brand. Um, um, so yes, yeah, what I assume that most people that are watching this, they're not going to be large companies. They're either starting a business themselves or they already have a business started. So I'm going to talk to you some of the, some of the things to think about when you're starting a brand um, or if you've already started some of the things you need to think about now and then try to go back and address or fix. But um there's a lot of pre-planning that goes into to creating a brand or creating a company. Um, so you have your company name, creating a logo, getting a website URL. So that's the, like for me, it's angryape.com. Um, so the URL is, is important. Getting your social media handles um, all to be all the same, that can be difficult. Uh, so and then checking the legality of your name. So making sure it doesn't conflict with somebody else who already has a business um, either in the industry or doing something similar so that you don't create that brand confusion. So these are, these are all things, at least the first four, the company name, the logo, the URL, the social media handles. Those are all kind of things I do at the very beginning when I'm helping somebody, when I'm creating a brand for myself or when I'm working with somebody to create a brand. Um, and then I, I usually go and check the, check the legality of the name, but you kind of want all those things to happen in concert um, because you might come up with a, a great name, a great logo, and you can't get the website. You can't get any website it's even close because the the name is too popular or, or whatever somebody else bought it people can buy anybody can buy a url and they can they can sit on it and um, they can either sit on it forever or they can try to sell it to you so i had a client that was trying to come up with a, a name for her company she's creating a wellness company and I was trying to think think of names and so part of what i was doing was we came up a list of names and then we would uh, I would immediately search to see if that if they like what domains using that name were available um, and she got really frustrated with that so you have to sometimes you have to get creative 
because most like a, a website you're a dot com costs um, somewhere 14 16 dollars a year so they're pretty inexpensive um typically you want to try to get the dot com so they created different extensions so dot com dot biz dot org um and they have a bunch more now they have like dot life dot photo dot whatever um dot com is mo by far the most common and what people automatically assume if you didn't tell anybody what your domain was they're going to type in your name dot com and see if they can find you um all those extensions were meant for different things so dot com was meant for business dot net was meant for people in the networking like computer networking or computer kind of industry dot org was meant for nonprofits. Um, so, but it's all, it's all kind of got gotten, gotten mixed up because anybody could buy anything. Um, so what one thing that if you do come up with a great name, great, well, and you get the URL and you get a URL that works for you. Um, I encourage people to buy. So if you got the if you got the dot com, I would get the dot net, the dot biz, and maybe the dot us um, to help protect your brand because somebody else could come in. If you bought the dot com, somebody else could buy the dot net, and then even if it's not in the same industry, somebody could buy that that URL and become more popular than you, even in their industry. And it makes people makes it harder for people to find you. Um, so, and this is more of a a personal thing for me is I buy everything I can around it. So when I came up with the name of my company, um, I had a lot of a lot of trouble. So I went through this process myself. I I was trying to come up with company names. the The reason for my the name of my company is I wanted something that was going to be unique and grab someone's attention. I didn't want a boring name. Um, some, somebody had told me, just my dad, um, so just call it JT Graphics. I was like, that's not, it's not exciting. It's not fun. Um, and so I just came up, I had um, my sketchbook and had just words, just writing words on paper and doing sketches next to it. And so, I mean, this was a Probably took me about three months to come up with my name um but i i was kind of starting it as a side business when i first started um but i came up with words so on the on the on the same page i had like mad monkey grumpy ape angry ape and then i had a, a sketch of a person that kind of looked like my logo um my logo um so it's a it's an angry ape um, but so it was originally a person and then I, and then, uh, well, even before I got there, I had other names that I was going to call it. And I would, I would create a name, create a logo, and then try to go with the URL. The URL was always taken or somebody was doing something similar. Um, so that's why I, I read to really buckle down and just start getting creative with words and names. And, um, so I liked the angry ape, uh, name. Um, I like the logo. And once you get the URL, somebody owned angerape.com. But they were, they were, I thought they were a celebrity blogger. Um, and so I was like, nobody's going to do that forever. So I'm going to get angry ape.com. And um, the name of my company is Angry Ape Creative because I needed kind of a qualifier word to. Let people know what I do, but I do a lot of different things from, you know, logo design, branding, um, websites, social media, photography, um, marketing. So I do a lot of things, and I didn't know what where I was going to go in the future. So that's why I kind of use that broad term, creative, it gives people a little bit of an idea of what I do. Um, but I also wanted the short version, Angry Ape, because I wanted people to have to type in angryape.com every time. Although I do own angrape.com or angrapecreative.com. Um, I, I own that domain, but I, I bought angry-ape.com and 
my my thought was when that other person was done being a celebrity or a celebrity blogger i would buy the domain uh, from them or i'd pick it up on the open market um somebody else so that person did they weren't a celebrity blogger they did music reviews um so i didn't look into their business close enough but they uh, they did change the name of it of their business and it's probably had something to do with me buying every other domain i could think of every getting all the social media handles everything else i could think of that was around engrave i purchased um so i'm assuming that maybe had a little bit of a factor in um, getting them to change the name of their company um but somebody else purchased somebody else, i was on the list to to buy it, to be notified when the domain was available and to to put a bid on it somebody else bought it and they were gonna they were off they were trying to sell it for 500 bucks and um at that time i had i'd fairly trademarked my lo my logo and my name um so my attorney told me that i could take it from them if they were just squatting on it if they were just using it or if they just purchased it and were just selling it i could show that that i own that brand and I could take it from him, but he, he asked me how much they wanted for it. And I said, 500 bucks. He's like, we should just buy it. Cause you're going to pay me, me more than that in legal fees. Um, so eventually they dropped the price down to 250 and then I just purchased it. Uh, but I, I own a lot of different stuff. So I have angry dash ape.com angry ape.com. How will dot net dot us of both of those angry ape creative without dashes with dashes red ape um i have angry ape t-shirts angry ape logo design angry angry ape photography anything i could think of that somebody might try to encroach in on my space um and and i still have people trying to use angry ape in their in the names of their companies um which I didn't realize it was going to be that popular of a, a name or that much of a desired name. But I've had people who've tried to use my logo for their logo. They've asked if they could do it. Um, they, one guy wanted to create a company called Red Gorilla Marketing. He wanted to use my logo. So I immediately, before I told him anything, I went out and registered red, red gorilla marketing.com dot net dot us. Um, and then I told him, no, um, I'm very protective of my brand. Um, I want to keep my brand very consistent and keep everybody out and away from it. Um, so if you're, if you're, if you're coming up with a new company, things I would recommend are come up, come up with the name of your company, um, and then check URLs um see what is available so you can go to i always tell people to go to angryapedomains.com i'm a reseller for godaddy but that's my reseller page you can just search domains there and see what's available and sometimes it'll say okay dot com's not available but this is or it will put uh, another word in front of it of whatever word you want um so that can those are the first two things I would do if you're working on your own. If you're working with a designer or marketing um, consultant, um, you know they can help you out with that. Probably you're going to want to hire a professional to design your logo, which we'll, we're going to talk about logos a little, a little bit later. Um, but at a minimum, you know, come up with a good name for your company and get a look for the website URL. You want the website URL to be as short as possible. Um, so actually I have all these steps listed out. So um, when you're naming a company, uh, think of a good name that appeals to your target audience. You want to be easy to remember and not easily misspelled. Um, and then you also need to think of it, if it's, if, if it's multiple words in the name, if they're all run together, it doesn't spell something something else that's untoward or if you have a lot of uh, letters in a row 
So maybe first word ends with two S's and then the second word begins with an S. Then you have three S's in a row. Because if, if you're making the URL, there aren't gonna be any spaces. And so that can be easily mistyped or misspelled. Um, I tell people not to choose words that uh, people might have trouble uh, spelling. So think of words that you misspell all the time. Um, I wouldn't use those words. We want it to be easy to remember. So like I said, um, the, my official business is Angry Ape Creative, um, but I use the, the URL Angry Ape. It's easier to write. It's easier to, when I create my email, j at angryape.com instead of angryapecreative.com. Uh, and so all my other domains is just forward to my website or to a page on my website. So another thing is to run it through the urban dictionary, make sure that it doesn't have names you didn't know, didn't have meanings you didn't know about, or is that a good idea? Or? Yeah, uh, that is a really good idea. I, so angry ape does have a, a bad definition. Um, that used to be one of the first terms that, that came up when you typed in angry ape. Um, and so um, it was urban dictionary term. And I, I didn't even think about that at the time. Like I did my, I created my business, I don't know, maybe 12, 13 years ago. Um, so I didn't even think about it, but um, that, that is a good idea, if, especially if you're, well, I'd probably do it in any case because who would have thought angry ape was a negative term. But my, my goal then was to create enough content on my website and get listed on enough places to push the Urban Dictionary at least uh, listing at least to the second page so it wasn't the first thing that people saw um, i have run into a lot of um, crypto and uh, nft companies that have that have done things with the word ape or angry ape uh, so there's like there's one called angry ape army and there's bored apes and because that stuff's really popular right now they've uh Kind of depending if you just search angry ape or if you just search ape they i don't i'm not the first one um so um that's a whole nother story is getting your website to show up and seo and that type of stuff but um but yeah yeah back to your point check the urban dictionaries is probably a really good idea as well then you don't have to go through all the work of trying to push out that negative term or if, if the brand, so I still get people who, who try to connect with me or come to my site because they're looking for that music review site. Um, I, I get a fair amount of traffic from that because they were, they were pretty popular and they um, the links to angrape.com all over, the, all over the place. And so I've even had people send me demos of um, music. And uh, so there's still a bunch of links out there that link to Angry Ape. And I'm sure if somebody clicks it, they get to my site and they're like, oh, this is, what I, this is not what I was looking for. Um, so I get a lot of traffic, but it's not, it's not like helpful traffic unless they wanted a, a logo or a website. But most of the time they're looking for something about music. What if you've already got a logo, but you need to figure out how to make it uh, come alive, I guess, or, or become more relevant or, or what have you? Yeah, I was going to talk about that in a second, but we can jump down there. Oh, um, sorry. Go ahead. Well, no, no it's all right. Um, so you can, you can rebrand a logo. Um, actually, I have a whole section on that. So we'll come back to that. But you could rebrand a logo. So you can you have a, a logo concept I, and that you're using you can redesign it, change it, um, and make adjustments to it to, to either modernize it or make it more effective. Um, we'll talk about that in a second. Um, so name a company, um, get a URL. So checking, um, oh, I guess I didn't talk about that. So get a URL. So you wanna check and see if you can get the URL first, preferably the .com. Uh, purchase multi, you can purchase multiple URLs and just direct the other ones to the main site. So typically I tell people, like I said, buy the .com, but buy the .net. 
dot biz dot us whatever else and then just direct those to your main dot com um you're doing this just to protect your brand um you want to make sure that nobody else is doing something similar with a similar name or something that will create brand confusion um that was what i was running into when i was first i don't remember the names i came up with but um there was somebody one of the names i came up with i could get the url that i wanted but somebody else with a very similar name is doing like video production i was like that's too close um like i would have been well with my rights to do it but there's no um i was just starting out so i i had the option to find a new name create a different brand um so i wouldn't create that confusion um so it wouldn't Confusion would hurt me and hurt him, and I'd have to work extra hard to try to distinguish myself from them. So it's easier just to um, to avoid that from the beginning. Um, so you then you want to cr create a logo. Um, so if you can, you know, if you have like what I always like is when people come to me, they want a logo and they have some ideas. So they don't always not always artists can't some of them can't sketch draw anything that's fine if they have some idea of what they want it makes it a little a little easier um but i also don't want it to be stuck on an idea um sometimes um they'll say this is what i want so i'll design that but then i'll design other versions and 99 percent of the time they go with one of these other versions um so I first thing I would say is hire a professional um, because they do this every day and they their experience with what works, what doesn't, what a good design is. Um, so you want to have something simple that's easy to recognize. Um, I have a lot of recently, I don't know why, but I've been getting a lot of logistics and trucking companies approach me about wanting logos, and they theirs are always so complex and, and detailed drawings um somebody wanted a, a pencil drawing but he wanted his logo to look like a pencil drawing and i was trying to explain to him that doesn't doesn't work very well um with all that shading uh, you need to have a simple a simpler form you can do a logo with shading and um, gradients in it but you need to have a simpler form or as well um, you're basically trying to distill a complex concept down to its simplest form for if you want to have a really good logo. Um, also, if you can try to if you can get somebody to feel something when they see your logo, um, that's uh, so they don't always know what they feel. They feel something. I think that's that's how my logo is. Um, so when they see the big ape head, they're like makes them stop and think like first of all like what is that um i've had people who've had my business card just and it has, so on the back it just has the big ape head and um it'll sit somebody told me they had it sitting on their on their desk for two years and um then the, then they finally needed something and they called me um so if you can make people feel an emotion or feel excitement or feel something um you're gonna, you're gonna have a much more effective logo or design in general, but um, cause you want people to stop for more than a second when they look at your logo. Um, if it's a, if it's a, just a generic logo that doesn't look like anything, um, it's just a logo for a logo's sake, it's not really doing much for you. It's not recognized, it's not standing out. Um, so it's not doing, it's not doing a lot for you. Um, it was like our, when our life co-pilot, when we were putting it together, we were brainstorming we came up with a name and our graphic designer took off and and she comes back with like three or four different proposals and none of us were thinking of a of a hummingbird okay i mean and we saw we're like huh we don't really like that i mean you know we're thinking airplanes we're thinking well you know but it was like that just felt right you know so it's and it's you know, we've gotten more compliments on it yeah yeah and a lot of times when we're so I, I would say the hardest thing is 
des like designing for yourself. Like I even have a hard time designing for myself because I'm so ingrained in my business um, and doing, and I know what I do and trying to, trying to get that out is difficult. I can, I can easily des design for someone else because um, I'm not as a, attached to it. And I can see it from an outside perspective. And um, I don't have all those um, preconceived ideas that are holding me back um, for other people. But for myself, I still find it's hard to design for myself. Um, honestly, I, I, I don't even update my website. Um, I've been talking about redesigning my website for five or six years and I'll start sit down and I'll start planning it and then I, I just get way too in the weeds. And so that's why it's good to, to bring in outside sources to give you opinions and thoughts. And when you hire a designer, um, you know, they, they see it from an outside perspective. They know what works, what doesn't. Um, hopefully it's a good designer. Um, and they aren't caught up with those preconceived notions. Well, they always say the plumber is the one that has the leaky faucet. So, you know, it's the. Yeah, yeah. I definitely, um, it definitely applies to me. My marketing hardly ever gets done, uh, but everybody else is, is great, just fine. Um, so, um, the last thing is social media handles. So you want to try to get all your social media handles to be the same. Um, so ideally mine would all be angry. Ape. So my, my Facebook would be at angry. Ape. My um, LinkedIn would be angry. Ape. My Instagram would be angry. Ape. Um, I did not realize how popular, popular the word angry Ape was when I started. Um, people have that profile for all kinds of stuff. Um, but um, so you want to, you want to, you, you're going to basically, if you're going to try to be the same, you're restricted by the platform, the shortest number of character allowance, which I think is Instagram, which is at 16 characters. So, um, sometimes you have to get creative. So I was working with Lincoln square pancake house and they wanted their, So they didn't have an Instagram when I started with them. And then they wanted an Instagram and they wanted it to be at Lincoln Square Pancake House. Well, that's too many characters. At Lincoln Square, Lincoln Square is all over the place. So, um, or at Lincoln is all, all over the place. Um, you have Lincoln Park in Chicago. Um, Lincoln Square has got to be, it's got to be, a, you know, 100 Lincoln Square complexes like um, shopping malls or you know, outdoor mall complexes. Um, so we came up with Eat at Lincoln. Um, so I'm not sure if they, if, they, if they stuck to that, but Eat at Lincoln was available on everything. So we could put on their business cards, put the icons for Facebook, uh, LinkedIn, Instagram, YouTube, and then just put at eat, at eat at Lincoln, and it applied to all of them. So otherwise, some people just put those icons, and then you have to go find find them on that space. But if you can tell them what it is, but if they're all different, if it's if one is Lincoln Square Pancake, eat at Lincoln, then you have to list all that and just kind of jump puts a lot of extra stuff on your on your business card or wherever your flyer or whatever you're trying to promote out there. Um, if you're just doing links from your website or whatever, that doesn't make a difference. Um, but it just, it helps with that branding. You want to be, try to be consistent with your, your brand. So if you can make that, um, that social media handle the same, it's going to be more effective. Um, as pe pe people just have one thing to remember, they have to remember all, all three to five of them. So, and then the last thing is checking the legality of your name or conflict. Um, this can be, can be expensive sometimes. Um, so I used to work at the finish line at their corporate office as a graphic designer and the finish line bought 
a store called Man Alive. So Man Alive was a store in the mall. And um, so the finish line bought it and was going to rebrand it. And I, I don't remember what name they originally came up with. So they came up with a the name. They hired a design agency to come up with the logo. And then somebody did some research and found out that somebody owned the website for whatever name they came up with, or they owned they owned the on the website or they owned the name. They had it like federally trademarked. And so I think they reached out to the guy and he either didn't want to didn't want to sell it or was asking too much money for it. Um, so they had to they had to rebrand. They so they rebranded, spent a bunch of money, and then they had to rebrand before they could even launch. Um, so this time they hired they didn't, they didn't hire a design firm. They just got all the designers that worked at Finish Line and made us all come up with six different logos. Um, chose And they chose from that. They came up with a different name. Um, they did their research ahead of time to see if they could get, get the name and all that kind of stuff. But so um, that's kind of why you, you're, you're checking all those things at the same time. You're checking, coming up with the company name, you're checking to see if you can get the website social media handles it's kind of it's like the pre-work um so you don't want to just come up with names say this is my name and, and then go with it um you have to do some some pre-work and it it does take take some time and it's not not always all that fun to do but it's going to help you out in the long run so sometimes if you already have a company you have to go back and and figure some of these things out um so if you've already got your company established and you have your logo created, um, you need a website, then you have to get creative on coming up with a, um, a URL name. Or So a lot of people use um, get or go. So there's a zip line company in um, Eagle, Eagle Creek. Um, it's called Uh, it, something ape um maybe the company is go ape um but they they wanted to you know play on the fact of the apes swinging through the trees um but they had to do it with go ape because somebody owns ape.com whoever bought that has probably owned it forever and uh, so they had to they had to get creative so they probably changed i think they did change they had whatever they started with they made the company name go away. Um, but uh, so, but people will say, put the word get in, in front of whatever word they're trying to find. So, um, or go. Uh, so like Rainmakers is a networking group. I think their URL is go Rainmakers or get, get rainmakers.com. Um, so it's much easier if you can figure all this stuff out ahead of time. Um, but sometimes you have to do it after the fact. Um, what if you inherited, you know, let's say that you have a franchise. And so now you have a franchise that you've already, this is your name, this is what have you, but you're trying to identify yourself and, and market yourself and, you know, brand yourself outside of just under that one umbrella. Yeah. So sometimes that, that can be difficult if, um, depending on what the, franchise company, the main company allows. But I, I tell like insurance agents and realtors, they should always be branding themselves because they see, they tend to, to move from company to company a lot. And um, people are working with them mostly because of them, not because of the, the company they represent. Um, and so I tell them to, to brand themselves so create their own website so it could be they could have a site johnsmith.com um, or johnsmithrealty.com or johnsmithinsurance.com um, or then come up with so it, this is where you have to do that research to find out what's available but um could be indianainsurance.com or um You know, coming up with those things, then creating your own brand, and then co trying to co-brand it with your uh, your franchise company. 
Um, it's probably a little more difficult if you're like the franchise owner of a McDonald's or there's probably not a lot you can do. Um, but um, if you do have the opportunity to brand yourself and you're in like a service-based business, you can do that. You can always do things like, um, so if, I don't know if Jiffy Lube is a, a franchise, but if you own a Jiffy Lube, um, you're gonna, they probably have their, their overarching site and then they have like find a location and you have a page on their site, but you could do, uh, Credit site best car mechanic in Indianapolis or in Westfield or in Chicago or wherever.com and just start building that that up a little bit um, with traffic and um, you can start promoting that alongside. And so, so sometimes those larger brands will even link to that site, um, but on your business if if you're allowed on your business cards you could put that URL. Um, or even that you, that if in your franchise company, they give you your own website, you can create that URL and just forward it to, to whatever site the franchise gives you. That's one way you can, can do that. But, um, you're, you're, you're much better off if you plan for the future, um, plan for all contingencies. Um, so if you, if you might break away or move to a different company or something like that, you know, start branding yourself, um, getting a URL. So, I mean, URLs are fairly inexpensive. If you, if you buy a lot of them, like I have, um, they do renew every year. I mean, you can, you can buy them for multiple years, but they do renew. And so when you get that $300 bill, because you own so many of them, um, kind of hurts um so you, you really hope that they're, they're doing something um but um yeah i think i think making sure you brand yourself if you're in a franchise situation um so and i was just talking about rebranding so rebranding is always an option you can um if you have a logo and you want it to be, so maybe you started out the logo and you had your cousin's nephew do it. And, um, you know, it got you by, but it's not great. You can rebrand. So you can have some, you can have a professional designer like clean up that logo or they can redesign that logo. Um, but rebranding can, can sometimes be difficult. Um, and it can sometimes it can take a while to do because sometimes you want to do it in steps. Um, if you have a loyal following, um, I've seen brands where they'll, they'll okay they have one logo they're going to transition to this new logo, but they'll create two or three logos in between to transition people so there's not such an abrupt change from one to the next. Um, one of I have some examples find them um so i'm going to share my screen so mike's car wash i don't i don't know where all of the viewers come from, but um, Mike's Car Wash in Indianapolis, at least. Um, well, most of it, I think, I think they were in uh, most of Indiana and the, the, I think throughout the Midwest, but Mike's Car Wash, popular car wash. Um, they really had a good system down. So a couple of years ago, Mike's, I, I don't remember the whole story, but I think it was two brothers or two cousins but they split they split apart so they own the business together but they wanted to split apart well i think one wanted to expand more and the other one wanted to stay whatever so mike's split apart and so then um 
and you got crew car, car wash. So I don't know if anybody's noticed that, but you have crew car wash. So if you, and some people might not even have noticed that Mike's turned into crew. Um, so it's just almost the same logo, but Mike's, Mike's became crew car wash. Um, so this was the, this was the original logo. This was crew car wash logo and still is. Um, but now Mike's has changed to this. Uh, they needed, they, so they, they needed to separate. Um, they needed to maintain the, the brand consisti consistency and the memorability, and then they could, could switch. So Mike's car wash, I'm pretty sure it's, it's roughly the same font. Um, and so for a while you were seeing both Mike's and crew look like that, but now Mike's car wash looks like this. I don't know where, where they are. I, I only found this on the internet. I didn't actually, um, I've never actually seen a Mike's car wash with this logo. Um, but this is their new logo. So rebranding um, can take a lot of, you know, a lot of different approaches. Sometimes when you're rebranding, uh, like Starbucks. So this was the original Starbucks logo. And I think it wasn't even black, it was brown. Um, but if you think about it, what is this mermaid? Or this is actually... It's not a mermaid, it's a sea siren. But what does that have to do with coffee? Not much. Um, so because this was started in Seattle, they were trying to reflect the, um, uh, the shipping and the maritime um, feeling that they got from Starbucks when it originally started. So they had this hand-drawn, looking logo of a sea siren and Starbucks uh, coffee, tea, and spices. That's how they started. And then they went to a more graphical use of the logo, Starbucks coffee. Um, then as they became more and more popular, popular uh, they zoomed in showing less of the sea siren, um, but she's pretty iconic, just says Starbucks coffee. And now this is their new new logo. Um, if you got rid of the word Starbucks coffee altogether, and they just have the iconic logo, um, but it works for them because it's, they're so well known. One of their biggest branding opportunities or uh, things they use are their white cups with a green logo on it. You see those everywhere and you know it's Starbucks. Um, so one of the things, uh, that happened to them. So probably mostly maybe between here and here, but definitely between this and this logo, they got a lot of backlash from, from you know, fans of the brand. Um, so anytime you, you rebrand something or you change your logo, the more invested people are in your, in your brand, they feel like they're part of your company. They feel like they should have a say as to whether you get to rebrand or not. Um, so some people get really upset because people don't like change. They just want the same thing. Um, I think this is a, a very effective logo. And part of the reason they took the word Starbucks coffee out there is because they, they were starting to branch out um, internationally um, to, to non-English speaking countries. And there's been talks that, of them opening like wine bars and serving alcohol. So they didn't want to just be tied to just coffee. So their logo became a little more iconic, kind of like Nike, Apple, McDonald's, um, where it's just, you don't need the words anymore. It's just recognized by the, um, by the imagery. So it became very iconic. So if you are rebranding, sometimes you need to just be aware that if, you, if, you're, if you're a beloved brand, you have a lot of followers who are invested in your brand, um, you can get some backlash if you change your logo. Uh, so it's good and bad. It, I guess it means that people are invested and they like your brand, but they, they got a lot of hate on the, uh, on the internet when they changed. Um, so, uh, so the kind of the last area. 
So I talk about is um, different types of logos. So um, if you search, if you search on the internet for for different types of logos, you might you're going to see anywhere from five to fourteen different types of logos. People have different characterizations of it, but probably the the most um, I guess the smallest list, the most common are a word mark. So a word mark would be something like, um, so this isn't going to show up quite, quite right, but Disney. Um, so Disney, it's just, it's just the word Disney written in a very specific font. Sorry, it's supposed to show up on white. Um, but a very specific font um, that's, that's recognizable as the word Disney. Um, then you have letter forms. So a letter form would be like, like IBM. So it stands for International Business Machines, but it is just the initials um, in a very um, specific style with these lines through it. So they've gone through different um, iterations themselves. I didn't realize that they'd switch back to having have the lines go through it because for a while they were just, it was just solid. Um, they've gone back to the, to the eight lines going through it. But another one that they consider as a, um, as a letter form is McDonald's. Um, so I guess if you see this as an M, which I guess most people probably do, um, M represents the McDonald's, um, but it's also imagery because it's the, the golden arches. Um, <clears throat> uh, the next one is an emblem. So that's like Harley Davidson. Um, so this is an emblem because the type is tied to the shape. It doesn't work without the shape. So everywhere you, I'm pretty sure everywhere you, you see Harley Davidson, um, you're seen in this emblem shape. Um, it's with Harley Davidson motorcycles. I've seen it a couple of times with wings coming out the side, other, th other elements around there, but it, I think it's always with um, in, the, in the emblem. Um, so there, there are instances you can have multiple versions of your logo, um, or your or, or different different logos to represent your brand. Which we'll talk about in a second, but um, and I didn't spend a bunch of time looking, but um, most of the time Harley David this represents Harley Davidson, and they have a really strong association brand, uh, for their brand with this emblem. Uh, Next one is a pictorial mark. Um, so something that's easy, easily recognizable. Um, very, um, it, it's styled in a, in a unique way. This one, so our next one is an abstract mark. So this, the Nike swoosh, I think it's a mix between pictorial and abstract. Um, because it's not really, it's not an object. It represents an abstract thought of fast motion. Um, but a different one would be um, Apple. So Apple is very stylized, pictorial mark. Um, so they have the bite out of the apple. This is easily recognized around the world. They like, I mean, they're so big, they don't need to, kind of like what Starbucks is get, try, trying to achieve. They don't need the word apple around it at all you just you know this is apple brand then you move into abstract marks so like the chase logo this it isn't anything it's an abstract design um but they've have used this to convey the idea of Chase Bank. Um, and usually 
it works with bigger companies that have a lot of like sub brands or different departments or features, they um, they can use or they tend to use um, kind of ab more abstract designs for their their stuff. Um, the, the last one is a combination mark. So Chase, like I said, you can have multiple uh, versions of your logo or different logos to represent brand, but there's with the words and the mark. Um, so combination mark is a word mark and brand mark together. So the brand mark would be a pictorial or, or abstract mark. Um, some other ones are uh, Adidas. So sometimes you see it with just a flower and then sometimes with the word Adidas. Um, Adidas is unusual because this was their old logo and I think in the, I would say the mid to late nineties, they changed their logo to, to the three stripes. Um, and they, most of the time when a, a, a brand changes or rebrands their, their logo, they, they go with uh, their new logo and they, they, fruit, they leave the old one behind. Um, Adidas, I think found that people were really nostalgic for the old Adidas logo and um, they it began a surge in popularity. So they bring this back. So you can easily find, um, I don't know if you, if you, well, they probably have it on some of their, some of their, um, their lines of shoes, um, the old logo, but mo but on the, on apparel, you can find the old logo or the new logo. Um, uh, this is kind of their their newer, uh, more elite technical stuff, and this is a little bit their throwback stuff. But still, just this this one is just as popular for them. Um, oh, another just iconic mark is is Jordan. Um, so it's. I would say this is a pictorial mark, um, easily recognizable as Michael Jordan on all of, all of his stuff. Um, he just represents his brand. So a lot of brands can have different, different logos. Um, so Disney is an example. Um, they have the word Disney, they have Disney World, which shows the Magic Kingdom. They have Mickey Mouse that they use. They have stylized versions of Mickey Mouse that they use to represent as their brand. Um, some brands have have sub brands that they'll they'll use. So Nike has um, Nike Air. So separate from Jordan, they have the Nike Air. They have um, Nike Plus. I don't know if they still have that anymore, but they had this little device that in your shoes and certain shoes that would connect with your your apple phone um, to track your uh, running progress and stuff so people will create different brands and different um different logos to to represent their brand uh, so I was just gonna show you, so some of the stuff that when I'm working with companies, um, I create what I call a branding guide. And so this is what most large companies have. A lot of smaller companies don't have this, but I think this is super important for a company um, to know this stuff because people come to me all the time. They want, they want a website business cards, flyers, a billboard, whatever, whatever they want. Um, and I'll say, do you have a branding guide? Do you know your, your brand standards? A lot of people don't. And this, so, so I started, I actually came, I realized this as I, when I was working for other companies, um, I was working for a company, CP Morgan, they were a home builder. And a lot of times I was having to put, um, 
different companies that we use our our, our painters, our drywallers, whoever else, uh, put their logos on our flyers and brochures and things. And I would contact the company and say, do you have that logo in an EPS in CMYK? And they're like, what are you talking about? Um, so you as a, a business owner don't necessarily need to know that information. If you have a marketing department, a designer, or a marketing consultant that you, that you talk to, but it's something you want to get from your designer. So when I design a logo, I, so it's, a, it's a little more expensive. I don't just create, I tell people, I don't create just logos. I create brands. And so this is part of the branding process. So I give them this, it's usually four to six pages, uh, the details out their logo and how it's used. Um, so this is the logo that, got, that we came up with for clear results consulting. It's a lighthouse. Um, and then, so it shows the logo in full color. And so he has two versions. He's got the combination and the uh, pictorial mark that he can use. Uh, and then I show it to him in, in black and white. So one color, black and white, because um, there could be an instance where he's he can only use it in black and white. So he needs to have that. I show him it reversed, so white on black. I do a grayscale version. So it's just using uh, percentages of black. So and I think later on it tells us what percentages these are. Um, I detail out the fonts that are used. This is, a, this is really important because um, if you are gonna change, change your font or if you're gonna use this, if you're gonna create something else. So I have another example where somebody needed to change their tagline and I had to try to figure out what the font was without having anything like this. Um, so it becomes more difficult. So here is Adobe Caslon Pro Bold and then just regular. So it's the same font family, just two different ways to font. But then I detail the font, how it should look. Um, and then the colors. Colors are really important for branding and being consistent. So you want to um, define your colors. The way I do it, I define them. I define the Pantone color, but so I use my Pantone color charts. I have my my colors. Choose, my clients choose their color, so it looks like this. So on here. These two colors are the same color. One is a Pantone color, one is CMYK. So CMYK stands for cyan, magenta, yellow, and black. So that's what your, your inkjet printer prints. Um, <clears throat> that's what an offset printer prints. So there's offset and there's digital printing. Um, digital printing would be like your inkjet printer or there's some uh, printers that print on like large they're essentially like large copy copy machines that print digitally. Um, CMYK, you tend to get uh, better colors, but it basically creates four different plates, one cyan, one magenta, one yellow, and one black, K stands for black. Um, and so it, it presses a plate and it presses the next color plate. So it presses those four plates and you get your full color design. Um, that's what magazines are printed in CMYK on a press, uh, offset press with plates. Um, so I tell my clients to choose their color from a color chart, choose it in CMYK because 90, 95 to 99% of the time they're going to be printing with CMYK. Um, the Pantone, Pantone color, so Pantone is a company, um, they're like the color gods. And they, they define colors that everybody can use. So they do it for all the different industries for graphic design, uh, paint, textiles. Um, they have metallic stuff, but they create specific colors. So these colors are not always the same. Um, 
So I don't know if this is going to show up on camera, but these are supposed to be the same color. This is more of a blue. This is more of a purple. These are supposed to be equivalent, equivalent of each other. Um, so I make sure that my client knows that they're looking at the difference between those two colors when they're choosing their color. And then we, we have to determine how big they are. Cause if you're a, if you're Coca -Cola, Jay, I hate to do this, but I have to run to another appointment. This is really good stuff. Yeah. But I will be putting your name and your contact information on the um, the video as we put it out. Okay. So that we can go back to this. But this is fantastic. I thank you so much for coming. But like I said, I, I have to run. So, uh, but thank you very much for sharing with us today. I'll get this video out. I'll get you a copy of it as well. And okay. we'll get this thing going. This was phenomenal. Thank you so All much. All right. Yeah. Sorry I went over. I, well, oh, no problem. <laughs> Um, I just I, I I booked myself too tight. <laughs> I'll oh, no. See you later. Bye -bye. Yeah, okay. Thanks.